uh, first of all, welcome everybody. Uh, I know it's different times for different people, and uh, so it's great. And one of the, I guess, one of the uh, funny joys of the pandemic era, right? You could kind of join at any time. It's not the same biological time for you if you were in a specific uh, location. Uh, I just want to take a couple of minutes to tell you that this particular winter school is focused on, well, winter for those in the Northern Hemisphere, winter school is focused on uh, um, neuroscience. Um, and the idea is to think about uh, neuroscience in a quantitative way. And I'd, I'd say as a practicing neuroscientist right now with an engineering background, neuroscience is perhaps one of the uh, few life sciences fields that has always taken inspiration from quantitative sciences, right from the beginning, you know, 50 years ago, 80 years ago, uh, using you know, mathematical and sort of physical sciences tools to try and understand the brain. So I think it feels quite natural to have a quantitative biology uh, school in, in this field. And you know, this also is reflected in uh, the speakers that uh, the lecturers that you will hear from. So I hope that the school will um, inspire you, those of you with uh, quantitative backgrounds to think about neuroscience, neurobiology as a field that you can actually apply your quantitative and mathematical and physical sciences chops to. And conversely, if you are a neuroscientist, you can also see how moving forward, uh, thinking, thinking about the brain quantitatively in mathematical terms is, is actually vital, to be honest. And I think I don't think I have to tell, uh, tell all of you, but just, just keep that in mind. And as you participate in the course, just, uh, just keep that in mind. Um, so I think, uh, let me just uh, start uh, introducing Suhita Narkarni so that we can get going, since I see that it's, we're approaching the time when we're actually supposed to start. So I, uh, I have um, a, a couple of Zoom uh, etiquette and Zoom protocol things. I, by now, I think this is all old news to you, but let me just make a couple of points very clear. Given the size of the crowd, it's probably not going to be very helpful if people just randomly vocally interrupt just, just because of the numbers here. But I think we do want this to be interactive as much as possible. So let me ask you to, during the lecture, let me ask you to type in in the chat if you have any question that really is preventing you from moving forward. The questions that can that are sort of curiosity, like, oh, what about this? What about that? Those are all fantastic. But we may not stop the flow of the lecture to answer that then and there. We can, we'll have plenty of time to discuss at the end of the lecture as well as throughout uh, the next few days. But if there are things that really feel like, oh, if you don't understand this now, it's just pointless to keep moving forward, then I may interrupt Suhita to, to just to say, okay, what about, like, can we just clarify this? So feel free. But of course, as you can as you can imagine, everything is good in moderation. If you if you just write a lot of things, if they're flowing by very quickly, that's like a YouTube channel or something that may be a little hard. So you strike the balance between please feel free to ask things on the, in the chat, but also you know just just you know wait till the end if you think things can actually uh, wait right. And there's uh, as VJ points out, there's also the Slack channel which I haven't actually joined, but the Slack. Uh, is you know these days at least for the younger generations you know it's pretty active and you can you can do that and that also allows all of you to react to each other's points right to do so you don't necessarily have to wait for for us to uh, uh, talk about it okay so that that's the stuff and um, later on at the end of the lecture I think uh, depending on when we end we'll have some discussion where you can do the I think a participant raise hand in the reaction button I think it's probably the best way to um, to to uh, let yourself know, and then you can uh, unmute yourself and ask the question. So hopefully we'll get to that soon. Uh, let me uh, just briefly introduce um, uh, our Professor Suhita Narkarnis. She is an Associate Professor in ISER Pune, uh, which is an absolutely fabulous campus, both intellectually and physically, which I've had the pleasure to visit a few times and, and gotten to know um, Suhita there. So she actually started uh, in uh, physics and got a PhD, I think formerly in physics at Ohio State. Well, and she bit the kind of computational theoretical neuroscience bug and went to the Salk Institute in San Diego to do her postdoctoral fellowship with uh, Terry Sanowski and also working with Herbie Levine. And uh, the funny coincidence is that my postdoctoral mentor was also Terry Sanowski in part. So we kind of have the same academic parent, if you will. And then she moved uh, uh, to ISER Pune 
some years ago and set up uh, essentially one of the first you know, computational neurobiology labs within India. There have been maybe a couple of other, one, other ones, but she's a, sort of a pioneer in that respect. Uh, and she's been there ever since. And uh, I really wish I was there in person visiting both ICTS and uh, ICER Pune and, and, and so on. But, but here we are, hopefully, in the near future. And, uh, and again, before I hand it over to Suhita, I want to actually acknowledge Vijay, uh, Antonio, and all the others who have worked hard, uh, in particular, all the administrative uh, staff who have taken care of the fantastic practical aspects of things. So here we go. Let's get started. Uh, pass, passing the mic to me, Venki. Yes, I am. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Venki. Uh, thanks, Vijay, Vatsala, and Antonio for this uh, opportunity. I uh, wish it was in person, um, nevertheless. Um, and as uh, Venki said, we'll play it by the ear, see how it goes. Um, happy to take questions if, uh, if it's interrupting the flow of um, information being transferred. Um, uh, given that this is uh, the first lecture, I think it's part of my job description to uh, set you up a bit before we get our hand dirty with all the details. So um, I'm going to share my presentation. You know, I'm also going to turn off my video for now. And, you know, when I take questions, I'm going to turn it on. I have, I know from my students that my voice breaks uh, intermittently when my video is on. Uh, but for the discussion, I'll turn it on again. Um, and I'm going to share my screen. Do I have, sh do I have sh screen share? Okay. All right. Um, so I promised uh, to take you in uh, slowly and delicately. So I'm going to start you off with a, uh, a quote by uh, uh, Hippocrates. Uh, and I can't read it because. Okay. So men ought to know that from nothing else but from the brain come joys, delights, um, uh, laughter and sports and sorrows, grief, despondency and lamentations. And by this, uh, in an especial manner, we acquire wisdom and knowledge and see and hear and know what are foul and what are fair and what are bad and what are good and what are sweet and what, are, what is unsavory. And by the same organ, we become mad and delirious and fears and terrors of sailors and all this by all these things we endure from the brain when it is not healthy. And in these ways, I'm of the opinion that the brain exercises the greatest power in man. This is the interpreter for us of those things which emanate from the air. And when it, the brain, happens to be um, um, in sound state. Okay, why? I, okay. So, so what do you think is the goal of of neuroscience, given this, I guess, the overarching theme of the workshop and the fact that you guys are here, um, would you say it is to understand behavior, animal behavior? Um, or if you wanted to understand human behavior, uh, we are looking at, I guess, uh, the, the, the more accurate estimate is about 85 billion neurons, each making about 1,000 to 10,000 connections. Um, so the dimensionality of this space is mind-boggling, right? Uh, and we're not even including Gia in this. So, so I guess the, the follow-up question uh, must be, um, what makes us humans special, if at all? Um, if we can understand brain, what about us makes us want to understand brain function of other animals rather than them studying us? Uh, so... Let me put this forward to you. Like, what do you think? Is it the brain size? Probably not, right? Because human brain weighs about 1.5 kilograms, while an elephant is about 5 kg, uh, whale is about 9 kg. Um, is it the total number of neurons then? Um, it's actually not. It's more, more, more like neurons per body weight. Uh, just some general notions for you to remember. Brain sizes in general grow with body sizes. However, two brains of the same weight need not have uh, identical uh, 
can need not be identical functional units. For example, a cow brain or a chim brain, uh, both weigh about 400 grams, uh, but obviously these don't have uh, identical uh, cognitive properties. So what is it about us that makes us special? Um, humans have the largest brain to body weight ratio, uh, but it, I, I did say that it's not a great indicator of cognition, right? The weight of the brain. So what is it then? As it turns out, it's, 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 it's our cerebral cortex. Uh, out of the 85 billion neurons that we have, 16 billion of those uh, reside um, in the cerebral cortex. And if you consider a cerebral cortex as a seed of cognition, uh, then this is what makes us special, right? So basically a brain packs a lot of neurons per volume and especially in the cerebral cortex, giving us the advantage over other animals, if you, if you can call it an advantage. Now, these neurons, as it turns out, you might have heard, use a huge amount of energy. Um, about 25% of your total energy uh, is used by your uh, brain while it occupies about 2% of your body weight, right? Uh, and it's sort of you know, the number, amount of energy uh, that the brain uses is sort of a straightforward linear function of the number of neurons. So what allows us to uh, afford uh, such an energetically expensive machine uh, while other primates with similar body sizes cannot? Uh, and this is where it sort of gets interesting, right? So a primate eats about eight hours a day. And um, if, if, if you take a primate, with approximately our brain sizes, they have about 50 billion neurons. Um, gorillas who are larger can only afford 30 billion neurons by spending uh, eight, again, the same number of hours eating, but they have bigger bodies that they have to support. So with the 86 billion neurons and 60 to 70 kilos uh, of body weight, we would need to spend about eight to nine um, hours a day, if not more. And this would, probably be hard, right? This wouldn't leave us any time to write poetry or make art or um, fall in love, et cetera, right? So uh, what, again, makes us, allows us to afford that many neurons? As it turns out, um, according to uh, the popular prevalent theory, uh, it's cooking, which was in, invented about 1.5 million, million years ago. So cooking allows us to use um, or to sort of have this pre-digested food uh, outside the body. Uh, this food is softer. Uh, it, it basically gives you a bigger bang for buck. It basically yields uh, more energy in less time. Um, and so basically allows us to have uh, that many neurons. So I hope it's a new perspective on cooking, uh, if you hadn't already heard of this. Okay, so where did this whole thing start, right? It all Okay, so um, this whole thing started with, of course, Ramon y Cajal, the father of modern, modern neuroscience. Uh, he basically used the Golgi stain uh, to propose that the brain consisted of discrete cells, uh, neurons. Uh, this was in complete contrast uh, with the reticular theory proposed by Golgi actually. Uh, he, he proposed that neurons form a continuum like arteries and veins of the circulatory system. Um, the battle was actually bitter and uh, long lasting. And as it turned out, both of them won the Nobel Prize uh, the same year. Uh, and Golgi did not fall short of going after Kahal even at the, uh, at the prize ceremony. Um, Kahal, as we know, of course, emerged uh, the winner in the end, right? Uh, Kahal's drawings have provided a uh, foundation for uh, modern neuroanatomy. Uh, uh, where he, he's, I'm not. I'm sure you must have seen some of these beautiful uh, 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 drawings. Um, he worked out circuitry of uh, many regions of the brain using improved um, uh, uh, Golgi stain. And I guess amongst all the things attributed to him, uh, sh showing what a forward thinking and a genius he was, he already seemed to suggest that glia, the other types of cells in your brain. Uh, they're called glia because they were thought to be just the glue that provided structural support, support to the neurons. Um, he already sort of suggests here that they must do something more, right? They must contribute to important functions. And this was, you know, 100 years before, uh, more than 100 years before this was actually proved. Uh, 
little bit more about astrocytes uh, maybe in my lecture tomorrow, but it's, it's a good place to have this in, in, in uh, 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 concretize that, you know, there's more to your brain than just mere neurons. Okay, so neuroscience is truly modern multidisciplinary subject, uh, which seeks to understand the most complex organ in the body, uh, the brain. Um, it, 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 it draws from biology, chemistry, physics, philosophy, psychology. Now, brain is often described as a hierarchical uh, structure, right? And um, this is, of course, uh, an oversimplif oversimplification. This is a very famous uh, illustration that I'm sure Venki is familiar with from, uh, and everybody from Terry's lab uses this. Uh, uh, now, uh, this is sort of the reason it's so simplification because we already know that these levels are intimately uh, interwoven or juxtaposed, right? Anything that happens at the level of molecules and synapses uh, can have far reaching consequences all the way directly to behavior, right? And neurological diseases are a good example uh, um, uh, uh, of this. Uh, just to give you a sense of where I come from, uh, the research in my lab focuses on uh, molecules, synapses, and uh, neurons. Uh, and so my own biased opinion is that a major impediment to a better understanding, understanding of the brain is, is our incomplete understanding of molecular principles uh, that govern network and behavior. And so if we have a better handle of, on these rules, molecular rules, we will be able to predict uh, network dynamics, we will be able to uh, uh, predict behavior, whereas a top-down approach is impossible to monitor uh, all the neurons at all times uh, with the changing connections because of synaptic plasticity. And, and a good example of this is, uh, is the worm C. elegant. Right? We've known details of each of its network for a long time, and we still are um, nowhere close to a uh, predicting its complete behavior. Now, I'm glad you're going to get a diverse set of opinions uh, uh, about this, but I did want to set you up with, with my, uh, my, my uh, strong belief on, uh, on the subject. Um, so, um, a word of caution uh, before you smell the roses or the posies, uh, before you dig deep into uh, research in neuroscience. Uh, and what do I mean by that? Let me give you a, a concrete uh, example. Uh, a concrete example uh, that, uh, that was that sort of uh, was discussed in this article in New York Times, uh, some debate about this, that is that um, low socioeconomic status at birth is, is, has a strong association or has a greater risk of developing um, schizophrenia. However, uh, despite this knowledge, uh, a huge amount of research of schizophrenia, schizophrenia is, is basically carried out by people like us, uh, neurobiologists, uh, genetic, geneticists who are trying to uncover the cause of the disease uh, rather than looking at socio-psychological or social factors uh, that, that specifically can connect uh, poverty to schizophrenia. And, and so, and I quote here, uh, it is more scientifically realistic for us uh, to find a way to change the human being itself uh, than it is to work together to change the kind of environment that lends itself emergence of disorder like uh, schizophrenia. So I wanted to put this out there, uh, this slightly uh, sort of uh, socialist sensibility of the kind of, uh, which I hope you keep in mind uh, while we uh, continue to uh, put on our blinders uh, for a good cause, right? Okay, so, um, Time to get our hands dirty. Um, what are uh, brains for? Uh, what you see here um, is a hint for you. Um, uh, and maybe you already know this is C squirt. And the C squirt as an adult attaches itself to a stationary object like a rock. And then we basically digest most of its own brain. Um, so what does this mean, right? Any uh, ideas already what this means in terms of what do you need brains for? Uh, the key word you hear is it when it attaches itself and becomes stationary. So according to Linus uh, in his book, Eye of the Vortex, 
uh, mindness state, and I quote here again, uh, evolved to allow uh, predictive interactions between mobile creatures um, and their environment. Uh, this suggests that the nervous system allowed, uh, evolved to allow active movement in animals. Uh, to move through the environment safely, a creature must anticipate the outcome of each movement on the basis of incoming sensory data. Thus, the capacity to predict is most likely the ultimate brain function. One could even say that self is a centralization of prediction. So in a sense, movement is the essential, indispensable action uh, of animal life. And here's another quote, um, which I found actually very, very deep. Kidneys make piss, uh, but brains make uh, epistemology. It is, this quote is attributed to Sidney Brenner, but I will not put my money on it. Epistemology is the theory of knowledge, especially with regard to its methods and scope uh, and distinction between um, belief um, and opinion. Um, so here we are uh, trying to figure out the most uh, complex organ in the brain capable of arousal, perception, context dependent reactions, anticipation, all that goes towards uh, producing consciousness, feelings and ideas. Um, uh, so arguably, uh, again, since we're here, the most important agenda for brain researchers is to understand behavior uh, and that's why you're here. Uh, and, and to take that slightly further, uh, maybe ask how do cell and circuits um, and neural dynamics uh, enable uh, responding, learning, and uh, remembering? Okay. And so how do we go about doing this, right? Given that we started off with the premise that we are dealing with a uh, the dimensionality of the space is 10 raised to 15, right? So how do we go about actually making um, uh, 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 dents in this? Um, no two brains are identical, right? Uh, uh, not even identical twins have the same genotype. So why should we even bother delving into something like this, right? How can we ever understand the working uh, principles? Um, as it turns out, uh, basic signaling mechanism uh, uh, behind a neuron, underlying a neuron, is electrical signaling. Uh, and this signaling has been preserved, uh, including the molecules uh, involved across uh, uh, phylogeny. Um, so, you know, one of the oldest things, for example, uh, beyond electrical signal signaling uh, is uh, chemical sensing, uh, bacteria use it. Uh, mechanisms that make the sensory detections even such as smell and sound are also somewhat conserved uh, across phylogenies, right? Um, we've used fruit fly uh, as one of the most valuable uh, model organisms and we use it to understand how brain organizes the repertoire uh, uh, of, of behavior. So the idea is to use or a popular strategy is to use uh, a simple model system in order to understand how the brain works and grab uh, the working general, uh, generalized principles that can be then extended to um, uh, other, other uh, animals. Uh, so one such organism is the paramecium, right? It's a single cell uh, 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 protozoa. It's a unicellular organism. Uh, it lives, lives in ponds, very much like humans, anything about it. it lives in ponds, stagnant pools where they can swim, consume bacteria, mate, avoid pre predators, and sense a variety of uh, uh, stimuli. Um, it swims with thousands of cilia, uh, and, and one of the most sort of uh, 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 prominent uh, behaviors associated with, that, with a, a paramecium is that uh, when it is bumped from behind, it speeds up. Uh, when it gets bumped from the front, uh, it backs up and uh, uh, changes uh, uh, direction, right? Uh, and so this uh, uh, use this single cell organism seems to use the same currency that complex nervous systems do, right? So they use electrical signals carried by charged ions uh, like sodium, calcium, chlorine, and potassium. So this primitive cell uh, also shows electrical excitability that makes a neuron a unique cell, right? It can fire action potentials, basically, the language used by modern neurons. And so 
it's it's considered to be a first draft or first version um, of of a neuron. Um, so the physics of signaling in a paramecium and in the neuron again remains the same, and it can be uh, broken down to uh, some of these uh, basic sort of uh, physics uh, 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 of these cells. Um, what you need is a heterogeneous distribution of ions, uh, which exists uh, in neurons. Uh, there's excess of potassium inside the cell, excess of sodium and calcium outside the cell. Uh, the energy source of ion movement uh, is the ionic concentration gradient across the membrane. Um, the dis distribution, this heterogeneous distribution itself is maintained by um, I actively by ion pumps whose energy is derived from hydrolysis of um, ATP molecules. Uh, so these differences, uh, the heterogeneity of uh, ion distribution is what results in concentration gradients, right? Or chemical potentials. And ions, of course, tend to flow or diffuse from regions of high concentration uh, uh, to regions of low concentration, right? Um, these ions carry electrical charges. Uh, uh, their uh, movement is influenced not only by, therefore, by concentration gradients, but also by electric fields. Right? Uh, what what makes um, uh, what makes uh, 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 so neuron electrically uh, uh, what makes uh, a neuron electrically charged or a, a, a negative with respect to its environment? Uh, the reason behind this is that the plasma membrane is basically only selectively permeable to some ion species. This causes a separation of charge across the membrane. Uh, and this ion separation results in an electric field across the membrane, which can, of course, then further influence ion movement in excited cells, right? So that's something to remember, right? So uh, you have uh, electrochemical forces uh, in action here. Um, so the basic chronology of electrical signaling is uh, something like this. Uh, when membrane proteins are induced to open a pore or open up, uh, 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 they allow passage of ions. Some of these ion channels are very, very selective. What this means is that when a sodium ion channel opens, it allows only sodium to go through. Uh, and this creates a pos net positive charge, right? And the membrane potential becomes positive. Uh, when potassium ion channel opens up, it only allows potassium to go through, making the ion channel more negative. Uh, these charges, as you can imagine, are not instantaneously flushed out. Uh, that's because there's the membrane in between. So this, and this is somewhat of an insulating uh, membrane. And so this uh, current, or this charge can basically uh, spread along the cell, right? Uh, at some point, one has to come back to equilibrium. And so uh, pumps uh, push out these excess ions out and things settle back um, uh, into some sense of... Uh, Here's another sort of slight uh, uh, diversion. Uh, action potentials are basically uh, excursions in voltage fields, right? And this excursion is um, stereotypical and repeated accurately and reliably as long as the stimulus remains the same. And we're going to spend, uh, as per my instructions uh, from the organizers, we're going to spend the uh, rest of the lecture actually uh, understanding how this action uh, uh, potential works, right? Um, and, and so I think uh, you ought to know that some of the most eminent scholars of the field uh, have proposed that the secret uh, underlying all conscious uh, activity uh, lies in the way that the cells respond to stimuli when they receive what, what how the cells respond to the stimuli uh, they receive from their environment, right? Uh, basically, what this means is that uh, in its ability to fire action uh, potentials. And this is what makes a neuron unique, right, compared to other cells, that it, it's its ability uh, to uh, uh, fire action potentials. 
and uh, and and so there's this very interesting uh, debate uh, uh, that uh, that has appeared in uh, Scientific American and. Please feel, I think you should go ahead and read it at some point when you get time. But I, I will again uh, quote from this. From a biological bio perspective, is membrane excitability, right? Excitability meaning this ability to fire action potentials. The unusual capability of certain types of living cells, which means neurons, to sense and respond to stimuli within milliseconds. In light of the fact that all living cells have enveloping membranes and exchange materials with their external worlds, it is unlikely that metabolic activity, biochemical homeostasis, or mere presence of boundary between cellular cell and the external world alone is sufficient to explain the origins of mind. Rather, the dynamics of exchange of materials across biological membranes, membranes differ remarkably across cell types. Understanding these differences may be relevant in explaining consciousness. Okay. So, what are action potentials, right? Action potentials are not graded. Uh, they are an on and off uh, response. They do not degrade, which means uh, they don't die out. Uh, they have a fixed size and duration. And so, a simplistic view would be it's like a Morse code. Uh, qualitative, qualitative description of this would be. Uh, uh, they are basically a combination of electrical chemical signal signaling across cellular barriers, which use ion channels and synaptic transmission for the chemical signaling. Um, all cells capable of carrying out APs are called excitable. And all this activity, again, uh, happens at the boundary of inside and outside of the cell because of differences in concentration and electric potentials, right? And we are going to focus on this precise boundary, the cell, cell wall, or, or, or the, uh, the uh, cytoplasmic membrane, right? To understand how an, this beautiful waveform of an action potential is uh, generated. Um, so before we do that, uh, we need to get some basic sort of rules uh, out of the way. Uh, the first one that I want to talk about is the North Black equation. Uh, it basically describes the passive behavior of ions uh, across, uh, across plasma membrane. Uh, ions slow down their concentration gradients and electric fields. Uh, this is, equation is sort of widely used in uh, neurophysiology. Um, so as I mentioned before, under physiological conditions, and movement across the membrane is influenced both by electrical field and concentration gradients. Uh, this is because ion concentrations inside and outside the cell are different. And the electric field is non-zero within the plasma mem membrane due to the separation of charges at the membrane, right? Uh, so the ion flux under the influence of both concentration gradient uh, uh, and electric field uh, can be written by combining the diffusion uh, and the drift flux. Uh, Einstein's relation allows us to express the diffusion uh, coefficient in terms of its mobility. Uh, so this is your uh, non-stant equation. Uh, in its current form, you can multiply it by uh, uh, Zf, uh, which is basically the molar flux. And, the, and so this becomes its current form, okay? Uh, I don't need you to remember all of this, uh, except a second, what, the, what, what, you need, what you need to remember, or what I'd like you to sort of uh, keep somewhere back of your mind is when the current is zero, right? Uh, when the current, um, uh, when the current, uh, uh, when the membrane is at rest, um, and the Nernst equation lets us determine the conditions under which the net, net current across the membrane is zero. Uh, so when you sort of uh, simplify this term, what you get is basically uh, the membrane potential is uh, uh, proportional to uh, ratio, log of ratio of concentrations, right? Um, it, also, um, it also implies uh, uh, that the membrane, uh, so uh, this also means that 
at this particular uh, value of membrane potential, uh, the membrane voltage and concentration gradient exert exactly equal and uh, opposite forces on each other. And that's something to uh, remember. Um, so let's take the example of, for example, uh, um, potassium ions, right? And we've already sort of met, we've already uh, spoken about how potassium is a lot more inside the cell uh, and uh, then out, outside the cell, right? Um, what this means is that if, if the ion channel pore opens up, potassium will flow outward, right? Down, down its concentration gradient. And the equilibrium potential uh, then, because of this equation, will be a negative value. As it turns out, it's about minus 75 millivolts. Um, this negative membrane potential results in driving the positive K ions to flow inward. So the two forces, outward chemical gradient and the inward electrical field, just cancel each other, result in a zero cross membrane ion current, right? And therefore, it's also the nurse potential is also called a reversal potential, as it is the potential at which the current direction of that ion uh, reverses its direction. Um, thus, uh, the nurse potential of sodium is a positive value because of the same logic. Um, here's sort of the laundry list of uh, some of the nuns potential of various ions in various cells uh, at various temperatures. Um, so notice that the, uh, the nuns potential of potassium is always negative uh, for the reasons I just described before. Uh, for sodium is positive. Also notice uh, that the, the ratio of concentration uh, of uh, of sodium and potassium inside and outside uh, is almost the same, right? Look, look at a typical mammalian cell. Inside the cell, it's, uh, uh, inside the cell for potassium is about 140 millimolars. Uh, outside the cell for sodium is about uh, 145 uh, millimolars, right? Uh, outside the cell is, uh, for potassium is about five millimolars. For sodium is between five to 15 uh, millimolars. So you can imagine if both these uh, ion channels are open at exactly the uh, at same time, uh, the driving forces are going to be exactly the same and therefore nothing should happen, right? Um, and so keep this somewhere back of your mind and ask yourself why the hell or why do we still then get uh, an action potential? Why do you get this beautiful uh, stereotypical form uh, of an action potential? Um, and so, by the way, uh, what this is, uh, is, is sort of, given that there are multiple species of ion channels, I thought uh, you should also keep in mind uh, that the resting membrane potential uh, of a neuron is typically around minus 65 millivolts. Uh, also notice um, that it is very close to the resting membrane potential of, uh, uh, of potassium and also ask yourself why this should be the case, right? If, 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 if all ion channels were equal uh, citizens, then you would get a number that is maybe averaged over all resting potentials. That's not happening. It's closer to uh, the potassium uh, resting, uh, resting membrane potential. Okay, this allows me to um, nicely uh, segue into um, the GHK equation, uh, the Goldman, Hodgkin, and Katz equation, as we build a more and more a sophisticated picture of an excitable, excitable membrane. Um, so the NPE, the non-flat equation that we just looked at, uh, describes ion current flow uh, in, a, in a simple aqueous media, without taking into account any specific properties of the membrane. Uh, however, uh, we know that why ions are flowing across the membrane, they have to pass through these uh, cross membrane proteins that form pores that actually connect the interior and the exterior of the cell. Um, and, and, and NPE that we looked at doesn't take into account any of this, right? Now, these ion channels are the ones that we're going to discuss over and over again, right? Uh, and we, uh, this is what is going to allow us to finally understand the Hodgkin and Huxley model of generating reaction potentials. Um, 
the GHK model uses the NPE, but adds an additional property uh, of the membrane. Uh, that is the distinct permeability of each ion channel to a, to a species of ion, right? So what it does not do, of course, uh, is address properties of individual ion uh, cha uh, channels in the membrane. It basically takes several assumptions, but pro provides a overall simplified description, taking into account individual permeabilities of these um, uh, uh, ion channels. Uh, and th so this is sort of the form of uh, uh, the GHK equation where P is the permeability uh, uh, and it can sort of be separated out as E flux, uh, which is which depends on the concentration uh, inside the cell and influx, which depends on the concentration outside the cell, right? So um, here is something to think about. Um, and, and it's something that you'll see over and over again when, uh, uh, in electrophysiology. Um, what's clear from here is that the current voltage relationship depends on the ratio uh, C out by C in. Uh, what's also clear that this relationship is actually uh, nonlinear, right? Um, of course, trivially, when C out by C in uh, or the concentration outside the cell uh, divided by the Couch concentration inside the cell is one, um, the current voltage relationship becomes linear. Whereas when it's uh, less than one, uh, think about it, uh, when C is when there is, there is more of a particular ion species inside the cell, meaning when we are talking about a potassium ion channel, right? When it's less than one, IV relationship shows what we call outward rectification. What it means is that the slope increases uh, when more membrane potential becomes more and more positive. And this is easy to understand, right? As, as the membrane becomes more positive, there's a positive feedback, it's easier and easier for potassium ion channels to, and uh, potassium ions to escape. And the opposite is true uh, for sodium. So for example, in a scenario where, um, C out by C in is greater than one, which means uh, a particular ion species, a concentration of particular ion species outside is, is more than inside of the cell. Um, in, under these circumstances, the IV relation uh, shows what we call inward rectification, which means that the slope decreases as membrane uh, uh, potential becomes more and more positive. And again, this is easy to see. As membrane potential becomes more and more positive, it's harder and harder for sodium ions to uh, go uh, inside. Okay. Um, and so the, these are what, what are, uh, what are what, uh, uh, typical uh, IV curves um, uh, of, of, of a neuron. Um, this is what you would call an outward rectification as the membrane gets more and more uh, uh, positive. Uh, the slope is getting steeper and steeper, right? It's easier for potassium to go in. And the opposite is true for uh, sodium, uh, where it's uh, as, 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 as you go towards more and more depolarizations, uh, or, or, or the membrane gets more and more depolarized, uh, your slope tends to flatten up. It's harder and harder for um, neurons to, or for sodium ions to uh, go in. Okay, um, so, um, all right, um, I think we should, so, by the way, so for a cell that is permeable to a family of ions like a potassium, uh, sodium, and chlorine, the overall current, of course, is carried by uh, uh, all three uh, uh, ion species. And the current, the GHK current equation would look something like this. Uh, if you wanted to calculate the resting membrane potential, we would do the same thing. Uh, use this equation to calculate uh, when the current is zero. And then you end up with this uh, GHK voltage equation, which looks something like this. Now, uh, I would like you to recall uh, something that I just mentioned a few minutes ago, the re resting membrane potential 
uh, is very close to the reversal potential of uh, potassium channel, ion channel. And the reason for this is that you would have to uh, invoke uh, the permeabilities of these ion channels, the property of permeabilities. As it turns out, at resting membrane potential uh, between these three ion species, the potassium ion channel is the most permeable. It's about 30 times more permeable than uh, sodium, right? Uh, and this is what uh, leads to, in this, uh, for a squid giant axon, this leads to a reverse, uh, to a resting membrane potential about minus 70 uh, millivolts, which is very close to uh, the K reversal. So the reason again for the resting, uh, for the reversal potential for potassium to be close to resting potential is because the cell membrane is most permeable to potassium ion um, uh, channel uh, uh, at resting membrane potentials. Okay. So, um, Hodge, so finally going to try and understand the Hodgkin Huxley's analysis of the squid giant axon uh, or, or basically Archituthis. Um, here's sort of a uh, artist's rendition of the Archituthis. Uh, and I have another one, which is, I think comes from another B grade movie, as I understand. Um, now, uh, the giant squid is, is, is no myth, uh, but very hard to find and therefore very little understood. A fully grown giant squid is classified as the largest invertebrate on earth with tentacles sometimes as long as the city bus, as it says here, eyes about the size of human heads. And as it turns out, yet no scientist has ever examined a live specimen or seen one swimming in the sea, or not many have seen one. Uh, here's an article in the New Yorker that profiles uh, somebody called uh, Steve O'Shea, who's a marine biologist from New Zealand, and uh, he's one of the hunters of, of, of the Archituthis. Um, as it turns out, his approach is slightly different. Uh, he's not trying to find a mature uh, giant squid. Rather, he's uh, scoring the ocean for a baby called uh, para, para larva, which is the size of a cricket, which he thinks he can grow in captivity. I, this article is very old, so I'm not sure if he has been successful, but I would think finding a cricket uh, cannot be easier than finding a large uh, Archituthis in the ocean. I'm not sure. It's, it, so, so here's here's um, here's this uh, in a in a very famous scene uh, from from Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea. Um, Jules Verne depicts a battle between a submarine and a giant squid uh, that is twenty feet long, uh, with again eight arms and blue green eyes, and calls it the terrible monster worthy of all legends about su such features, right? Uh, and uh, in, in this in this movie, a thriller movie, Beast, uh, Peter Benchley describes it as a giant squid that killed without need, as if nature in a fit of perverse malevolence had programmed it to that end. Right. So here's this. I'm building up to uh, to to actually uh, where we want to start to think about the archituthis. Uh, here's the real thing. Okay, I think I need to. Can you hear this guy? No, we can't. No, 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 there's no sound coming through us for me. I'm not sure the video is out here, but you, oh, okay, there you see, right? And this guy, finally, this actually just disappeared um, um, at a beach in man, right? Okay, with all this backdrop and build up, I, 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 hope, I, I hope you know I'm joking, right? Just so. Cheap thrill of getting a few laughs. And so, no, the hardest thing that Hodgkin and Huxley did was not to try and find the Archituthis. They actually performed their experiments um, on a giant squid axon of a regular squid. Uh, they do have axons that are rather large, about one millimeter in diameter, making it rather easy uh, to carry out the kind of electrophysiology experiments that, that, that they did uh, on, on these axons, right? So in still pursuit of having a clear, accurate, quantitative understanding of what enables neurons to fire these beautiful excursions in voltage space, we are going to look at a uh, electrical circuit equivalent um, 
of, of a biological membrane, specifically neuron. Now, this is sort of a common practice. Right? Very often, a biological membrane is thought of um, in, in these terms. Um, the membrane capacitance represents the dielectric property of the, uh, uh, of the membrane. Uh, it's typically conserved across friendly. It's, it's about uh, capacitance is uh, like one microfarad per centimeter square. Um, the membrane uh, resistance, or which is sort of the reciprocal of conductance, and we're going to talk a lot about in terms of conductance, uh, represents uh, the ion permeation or permeability of each of these ion channels, which of course is a dynamic uh, variable. Um, so again, to sort of emphasize uh, uh, the importance of these ion channels, um, the membrane conductance in excitable cells uh, are basically voltage and time dependent. And this voltage and time dependence of conductance is the primary controller uh, of electrical signals. And it is, uh, it is this precise uh, nature of voltage and uh, time dependence of conductance that Hodgkin and Huxley figure, figured out and, and for which they richly deserve their Nobel Prize. So we're going to, as we're going to uh, walk through their discovery, uh, we need to invoke some of the basic high school physics that you might be familiar with. Um, using Kirchhoff's laws, uh, one can uh, write a differential equation um, uh, for the total current flowing across the patch of membrane. It's the sum of the capacitive current uh, uh, and the ionic current flowing through the channels. Uh, the driving force uh, 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 that we mentioned before uh, is the membrane potential, Vm is the membrane potential minus the reversal potential. And, and the resistance typically in, in this formulation is more often uh, uh, is thought of as one over resistance is thought of as, uh, or described in terms of its, of its uh, conductance. And so this is sort of the uh, basic form in which we think of biological membranes. Uh, and you invoke uh, the basic minimum uh, ions required to fire action potentials. We need to include basically uh, uh, potassium um, channels and, um, uh, and sodium channels, right? And this is again, just an extension of the previous uh, circuit uh, uh, description, which includes uh, current contribution from potassium, sodium, uh, and a leak, which is like a generic small leak passively. This is not an active conductance. Now, the major sort of insight or, uh, came uh, 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 from Hodgkin actually, by the way, they described the conductance GK, which, which is, so, so the entire enterprise uh, of their work uh, is, is figuring out the complex behavior of this conductance, right? The voltage and the time, um, uh, dependence uh, of, of these conductances. Um, so what they hypothesize is that, uh, that both uh, GK and uh, GNA uh, could be described by multiple gates, which could be closed or open. So this is uh, uh, the gates, the number of gates. So in this in case of uh, sodium, uh, they could describe it by four gates, um, they called it N. Uh, for, a, for, for a sodium channel, they could also describe it by four gates, but they, they were of two distinct types, M and H. There were three gates of uh, M and one gate of H type. Now, what they hypothesized in this sort of this um, gate model, as it's called, is that, uh, that uh, the ion channel conducts when these gates are open, right? And each of them uh, can be open or uh, closed. And this is how you would describe their open and closed probability. So why is the probability that a particular gate is open? Uh, and one minus y is the probability that a particular gate is closed. And they can go uh, from open to closed with these voltage dependent rates, alpha and beta, right? So again, uh, to summarize, uh, conductance of these ion channels uh, can be thought uh, are voltage and time dependent. 
they can be thought of as uh, uh, being governed by gates and a chan iron channel can only conduct if these uh, gates are in per permissible mode or these gates are open, right? And these gates can be open or closed uh, uh, given uh, the membrane potential. So they open and close with a certain probability given the membrane potential. So these are the rates that govern the probability that a particular gate is open and closed. Uh, the third thing to remember, the fourth thing to remember is that um, sodium has only one type of grade, gate, whereas, um, sorry, potassium has only one type of gate, whereas sodium has two types of gates, uh, M and um, H. Um, and uh, what else do I want to say here? Um, I guess, let's see, that's it, right? So this is sort of the, um, if you want to know more about how they arrive at this whole uh, gate model, uh, the whole series of papers that they published in the 50s, early 50s, this is sort of the landmark paper that summarizes all their experiments and in data. So feel free to go ahead and um, uh, read it. These are not easy papers to read. But I'm still going to try and give you a qualitative tour of, of their experiments, okay? And I do have time for that. Um, so here it is, right? Uh, the reason they were able to do, first of all, all these experiments is, uh, or understand the nonlinear properties of these uh, ion conductances is because of a technique that was developed a bit earlier, and that's the voltage uh, clamp technique. Now, uh, voltage clamp experiments typically involve inserting um, two electrodes into the axon, one for recording the membrane voltage and the other for passing the uh, uh, current into the axon. What this does is, as the name suggests, um, this keeps the membrane potential clamp or constant, right? So this is sort of the basic illustrative uh, circuitry of the voltage cap experiment. The main reason why this was such a valuable technique to Hodgkin actually was that um, by keeping the voltage constant, they could measure the time dependent characteristics of ion conductances without uh, worrying about influence of the voltage dependent parameters. Okay, so that was sort of the beauty of using this voltage clamp techniques. Okay, so this is sort of uh, uh, what the voltage clamp data looks like. This is sort of a series of clamped voltages uh, that, uh, that was neuronal membrane was clamped at, a patch of neuronal membrane was clamped at. And this is, this, this, this is sort of the current that was me measured uh, over a few uh, milliseconds. Now, immediately what you see is that the early current uh, has a different direction. This is the inward current, which means this is the sodium current. So initially, uh, the current that seems to be triggered off is the sodium current. And later on, it seems to be potassium current, right? So there's already a sense that somehow the potassium current happens uh, later. Uh, the other thing that they discovered from these experiments is that the instantaneous, even though we spend a lot of time talking about the nonlinear relationship between um, current and voltage, what they discovered was the instantaneous conductances were actually linear. So what they could do was they could ramp up the voltage to a holding voltage or a clamp to value of voltage, and they could allow uh, 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 the current to flow in. And, and what they could do was divide this current at every point uh, by the clamped voltage to get the instantaneous conductance, okay? And so this data over here shows basically in instantaneous, con uh, instantaneous conductance uh, for a particular clamped voltage uh, over eight, millis eight, eight milliseconds. And this other, the whole family of curves is basically instantaneous conductances for a range of holding voltages or clamped voltages. Now, this was really, really useful data because once they had this data, what they could do, and so this is data for a uh, potassium channel. This is the data for sodium channel. Once they had this data, what they could do, uh, this, um, uh, a model for the potassium and sodium channel where they described the, so, oops, 
uh, where they described the uh, uh, potassium channel uh, uh, to be governed by uh, four gates, which all had to be open in order for the uh, potassium uh, channel to conduct. And sodium two by four with two types of gates, four in number altogether, which also had to be open uh, in order for the uh, potassium uh, sodium channel to conduct. Uh, what they were able to do was they were able to extract from each of these curves open and close uh, uh, rates, voltage dependent uh, open and close rates, the alphas and betas. Uh, once they had alphas and betas for a particular uh, membrane holding membrane potential, they could do it for a whole family or whole range of membrane potentials. And then what they would they what they did was they basically uh, plotted how alphas and betas for every gate uh, looked like uh, uh, over a range of uh, voltages, holding voltages. Right. So what you see here is uh, for the M gate of the sodium, uh, this is for the H gate of the sodium, and this is for the N gate of potassium, right? Now, immediately what you see is given that alpha is the rate with which uh, a particular M type gate opens, uh, what you see is that, uh, is that this M type of gate seems to open with depolarization, right? And it seems to close with hyperpolarization, right? So the value of beta is highest at negative membrane potentials, the value of alpha is highest at positive membrane potentials, right? So alpha, so the M type of gate opens with depolarization. The opposite is true uh, for H, which also governs the, uh, uh, the sodium gate. So if you look at the H um, gate, it seems to suggest or it shows, not suggest, basically shows that the, this type of gate, the H type of gate that governs the sodium channel uh, closes uh, with depolarization uh, uh, and opens with hyperpolarization. So the question you should be asking is, and how on earth do you get uh, the sodium channel to ever conduct? Because it's governed by two gates. And I have been saying this over the last few slides. The only way that a channel can conduct is if all its gates are uh, open, right? Um, so how do you get uh, the sodium channel to ever conduct? I, I, very clearly, the other thing to uh, uh, see in this that the gate model fit perfectly, right? They, they, it could it fit the potassium channel uh, with one type of gate, and it fit, and you needed two types of gate for sodium channels, and this is just empirical sort of experimentation back and forth uh, over the hundreds of hours that they landed up with this beautiful perfect model. Okay, going back to our question, what allows uh, these gates to find it, uh, what allows the sodium channel to finally conduct, and the beauty or the magic of it lies in the uh, temporal dependence. So uh, again. Uh, it's not to, to remind you that the conductances are not just uh, voltage dependent, they're also time dependent. And it's the time dependence of these uh, uh, gates that allows the sodium channel to actually conduct. So, so just to complete the uh, story here at this point, uh, they got this data from these, these kind of experiments. Each, each, of the, each of these curves came from some the instantaneous uh, measurements of conductances over a range of clamped voltages would give you something like this. Once you had the instantaneous conductances, you pick one value from here, or for example, over here, uh, it's been the clamped, the membrane has been clamped at two uh, milli, minus two millivolts. Uh, this is how the instantaneous conduct, conductance uh, evolves over uh, 15 milliseconds. And this, of course, if you look here, this looks like it's a it's it's conductance for potassium channel, right? It's GK. Uh, sodium has a more complicated form. It go, it's not monotonous, monotonous. And so from this data, you could extract uh, tau n uh, and basically uh, n infinity, uh, which is basically the steady state value of this particular gate. And from these equations, you could arrive at exact value for alpha n and beta n. And then you would do this for a whole set of membrane potentials, and you would get these plots. And they had to fit functions to this. I know this itself, uh, what, what appears to be a trivial task now, just employ MATLAB or Mathematica and fit the, get a best fit function. 
this required huge amount of hand crank calculators to actually come up with functions that would uh, fit these uh, uh, this data perfectly. And if you're interested, this this is what uh, these functions look like. Okay, so this is sort of the um, whole nine yards, right? So this is the complete Hodgkin and Huxley model. Uh, if you simulate this, uh, you will get precisely the beautiful action potential that we've been lusting after. Um, this is the equation for the current. Uh, in order to actually allow the membrane potential to evolve given its stimulus, what you'd have to do is in integrate uh, these uh, four equations. Every single uh, over uh, 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 at every single point in time, you'd have to update the alphas and the betas with these equations, and then and take the differential equation further in time, right? And so, uh, if you haven't already done this, uh, I, 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 please go ahead and try to actually simulate this bunch of equations on your own uh, using your favorite uh, programming language. Uh, and uh, you know, once if once you get your go to fire action potential, you can sort of scream top of your lungs. It's alive, it's alive, right? Because it is. Um, okay, so a little bit more about why we get what we get. Um, now, these are again uh, how the gates behave uh, over time, right? So, um, in this case, the holding uh, potential uh, or the clamp potential is at zero, from minus 50 it's jump to zero. Uh, this is how uh, uh, N gate uh, evolves in time. Uh, N gate rules uh, governs the potassium channel. And, and this is how M and H uh, uh, evolve in time. Okay, and you, could, you can run a simulation to, to actually check if they act, look like this. Now, um, what you, few things to notice here. And again, we are going to uh, uh, address some of the questions I raised before. A uh, few things to I do have, I guess, uh, uh, think about here is that you see that M seems to be the first to respond, right? M gate is the fastest, and N and H seem to be somewhat sluggish. Okay, and given that the sodium channel is governed by uh, M three H, three M gates and one H gate you would see that this particular time window between one and three milliseconds uh, is the window of opportunity for sodium to go through, right? So the thing to, I, uh, channel perhaps is because M is fast and H is slow. So um, as you depolarize the membrane, uh, what, what happens is that M immediately jump starts and opens up, while H knows that it needs to shut down, but it's sluggish and it takes its own sweet time uh, to start to shut down, giving this nice window of opportunity for sodium channel to conduct. Uh, and uh, the membrane gets depolarized. The more depolarized you get, the more the value of alpha goes up and it sets up a positive feedback loop, more sodium ion channels go in, okay, until a point when H closes. Okay, so that's the story of the sodium. Now, the other question you also must have asked is that, you know, sodium goes in, potassium goes out, the driving forces are approximately the same for both these ion channels. So, uh, um, what's what's the point, right? What's the how how do you, why do you uh, why do you ever get uh, the the action potential? And again, the the, the secret or the magic lies in their uh, uh, voltage and uh, time dependence. So as much as M channel, uh, the sodium channel, despite because of H, uh, seems to conduct first, the potassium channel conducts later, and so depolarization takes place first. And then at some point, the end gate, which is sluggish, opens up, causing potassium ions to go out, which starts the repolarizing phase of the action potential. Okay. And so all this, uh, okay, so sorry, um, I have one more slide that talks about uh, the time, the taus, right? So uh, again, uh, this sort of uh, summarizes how fast uh, a tau of uh, M is the time scale associated with uh, the M gate and um, order of magnitude almost slower are the H and N, right? 
right? Um, and again, uh, given how these are the steady state values of uh, uh, all these gates uh, for a particular for a range of voltages, um, and you see that here it would be the window of opportunity for for um, um, sodium ion channel to conduct. Okay, um, and this sort of slide summarizes uh, everything I've said so far. Um, a sort of qualitative, qualitative description of the Hodgkin Oxley channel um, or Hodgkin Oxley model. You have a small uh, current. Uh, it's, it's not about the threshold to jumpstart anything, and you get a small depolarization, and the membrane quickly repolarizes. Now, at 10 milliseconds, you give it a substantial uh, uh, stimulus. It's about the threshold. It's uh, in, look what ha what's happening here, right? So, large depolarization. What has immediately happened is that M gate has opened up really, really fast, right? And what you see that H which is already open. Remember, H is the one that's open at hyperpolarized voltages. So H is already open uh, when M goes up, but it's starting to close really, really slowly. So this gives an, a window of opportunity for the sodium ion channel to conduct. Once as that happens, you get this upstroke, right? Because uh, the, the membrane is more depolarized, more depolarized, meaning alpha goes up, more sodium ion goes in, right? until you reach the peak of the action potential. And at this point, if you see now, N is, now N also opens the depolarization. And if N opens up, since N is op associated with the potassium channel, it actually repolarizes the uh, membrane, right? So N is, uh, 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 saw, uh, is, is sort of starting to open up. Uh, with depolarization slowly, and this allows for the repolarization of the uh, membrane potential. Now, this is another thing to kind of keep in mind. Because the end gate is really, really slow, uh, it takes its own sweep. At some point, it's hyperpolarized. The end gate should have closed fast because it's a gate that also opens with, repolar uh, with uh, depolarization. It's supposed to close with hyperpolarization. But because it's slow, uh, the membrane potential actually goes below the rest uh, and, and before it comes back up again. Now, this part is called the refractory period. It's very hard for the neuron to fire action potential during this time, right? And this sort of sets the pace of uh, neuronal firing for a particular stimulus, okay? Uh, so, uh, for example, this becomes a rate limiting uh, uh, reason uh, for a particular neuron to fire at certain frequency, right? So, um, if neurons that fire are able to fire really, really rapidly, for example, inhibitory neurons that can fire at a few hundreds of hertz, uh, have a very short uh, refractory period. So that's something to uh, think about. Okay, so um, uh, given how uh, how uh, critical ion channels are to uh, important function, um, there are also several neurological disorders that are uh, caused because of malfunction of uh, ion channels. Um, separately, a lot of pharmacological agents and medicines fool around with altering functions of ion channels, right? The, the most sort of values, uh, the ones that alter sodium channels, um, cocaine does that, and uh, lidocaine, which is a sy synthetic substitute, is very often um, used as an anesthetic. It's, it's actually preferred by, uh, favored by a dentist. Um, a topical application basically makes that area numb. So he, here's a video to sort of, uh, um, Make I'm sure it's going to make you cackle, right? So here's here's a, and I'm for some reason I can you hear the video? Okay, there you go. I didn't feel anything. Yeah. Uh, I feel. Kind of felt good, didn't it? Uh, is this real life? Yeah, this is real life. Okay, now. This kid, poor kid is just coming oh, back God. after uh, a dense disappointment. I have two fingers. Lido King. Good. Or King. Uh, four fingers. Four fingers? No, uh, uh, uh. 
don't put that in don't put it in your mouth okay you feel good i can't see everything yes you can stay in your seat <laughs> I don't feel tired. You don't? Uh-huh. No? Drop stitches. Uh-huh. Drop stitches. Yes. On my teeth. Yeah, don't touch it. Don't. Why can't I touch it? Because it'll mess up the stitches. You have four eyes. Yeah. It's okay, bud. It's just from the medicine. Okay? Is this going to be forever? No. No, it won't be forever. Oh. <laughs> okay, so apparently this video went viral and made enough money to sponsor this poor kid's uh, education, college education. Um, Okay, so uh, this is sort of, um, you know, we, we, we looked at how, how a single action potential can be accurately or stereotypically or predictably reproduced as long as the stimulus remains the same. However, neurons have a large firing repertoire. A single neuron has a large, large firing repertoire given the kind of stimulus. And neurons across different brain areas uh, also have a wide range of uh, firing repertoires. And all this rich dynamical behavior arises out of details of, uh, of these ion channels. We've looked at only two basic uh, ion channels, the sodium and the potassium, that that basically form the foundational principles for, uh, uh, or give you uh, gives you an idea of the foundational principles uh, uh, for the excited, excitability of neuronal membranes. Uh, these are the two essential ingredients uh, for action potential. You need a fast, you need two things that you need in order to get action potential is a fast sodium channel and a slow uh, potassium channel. If you have these two things, you get action potentials. If you don't have any of these things, you won't get action potentials, right? So we basically uh, bro broke it down to the two essential, essential things. However, uh, as you can imagine, there's a whole zoo of ion channels out there that give uh, rise to uh, uh, some of the behavior that I showed you here. This is sort of this uh, really rapid uh, firing by stellate cell. They can fire a few hundreds of herds. Um, uh, there is this what is called adaptation, which basically allows neurons to fire really. And we look look at why uh, these neurons are able to do that. So uh, there are neurons who can fire really rapidly, and then uh, over a period of time, uh, slow down their firing and sometimes even stop. And then there is this burst, uh, which are very very important way of for uh, neuronal signaling. Um, various theories suggest that this is optimal way uh, for information transmission between neurons that saves on energy as well. Um, and and so all this and more uh, can be understood by understanding uh, detailed biophysics of, uh, of the ion channel. So I'm gonna. Uh, I do have. Uh, should I go for another five, five, seven minutes and then uh, give you time five minutes more and then maybe uh, do, uh, do uh, get back to um, uh, having a yes. chat with you guys? Yeah, okay. Yes, I think uh, probably no more than five minutes though. So I think there's lots of questions people are raising. Uh, so uh, you're breaking up, but um, so do I have five minutes? Yes, yes. And five minutes and then stop for questions? Yes, please. Okay, yeah, let, let me do that. Uh, uh, so, so here's sort of a, 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 a list of a list of uh, um, not nowhere close to complete, right? Uh, ion channels. Um, uh, the largest variety, as it uh, turns out, are are, are uh, potassium channels. But give, let me give you a quick overview of one or two, and then we can continue tomorrow as we talk about synaptic plasticity and um, uh, even more fun things than that. Um, so, so this is this is a this is a. a, a slow sodium channel, 
uh, what you want to immediately notice on what what appeared just now on your screen was the standard classic Hodgkin and Huxley. And, and, and I spoke about the window of opportunity, right? So this is your standard uh, Hodgkin and Huxley sodium channel. This is your special uh, sodium, slow sodium channel. And if you see that the window of opportunity uh, for this sodium channel is shifted leftwards, meaning that it's open at more uh, negative voltages. Now, what this does is that it can, of course, since uh, it opens early on uh, at more negative voltages, you can imagine that sub threshold signals uh, or, or, or neurons which don't have this ion channels are, uh, are less likely to fire action potentials. Basically, this makes this particular neuron more excitable. Uh, what can go, uh, what can remain a sub threshold sig a signal in some neurons. Uh, Neurons which have this type of channels will actually uh, allow uh, uh, for this signal to go through and you know uh, actually initiate an action potential. Uh, so it can amplify small depolarizations. It can sustain uh, 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 repeated uh, repetitive firing, and that's because it has a slow time scale, right? So it stays on once it. Uh, opens up, it stays on for a much, uh, 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 for in this case, for tens of milliseconds, right? So it allows for sustained repetitive firing. Um, then there are what, what, what are called a persistent sodium uh, channels, which are basically uh, uh, also uh, increase overall excitability. Uh, in this case, uh, the persistent sodium channel, remember our uh, caricature of uh, action potential ha had a sodium channel which had both an activation and an inactivation gate. Um, uh, 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 this is your standard Hodgkin Huxley, right? Uh, this particular uh, persistent sodium channel uh, does not have uh, an inactivation gate. So once it uh, opens up, it sort of stays open uh, over a lo long range of membrane potential. So it also has the ability to. Uh, increase overall excitability. Um, as I mentioned before, the greatest uh, greatest diversity of channels are uh, the potassium channels. Um, uh, they sort of operate over, again, a long range of, uh, large range of time scales. And this, of course, given that they are potassium channels, uh, they uh, have the opposite effect, right? They decrease the excitability of uh, the neuronal membrane. Um, uh, they actually made it make it harder for neuron to fire action potential. They cause delay in firing act, action potential, increase the threshold of firing uh, action potentials, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? Um, uh, calcium channels again, a large uh, diversity of cal uh, calcium channels. There are low threshold calcium channels. Uh, which I'm going to talk about uh, now before I stop because they're really cool. This is a cool phenomena that uh, I must tell you before I wrap up today's lecture. And then there are high threshold calcium channels that are typically open only uh, at the uh, because when it, when the system is triggered or the neuronal membrane is triggered by an action potential. This type of calcium uh, channel, uh, the high threshold one, once uh, give rise to a uh, huge amount of calcium influx in the cell and typically uh, trigger secondary uh, signaling uh, cascades. But let's talk about the low threshold calcium current first. Uh, and the phenomenon I want to talk about uh, is a post-inhibitory rebound. Now, what, what does that mean? Uh, uh, what this means is that uh, a neuron which is sitting at rest, if you push it further down, meaning if you hyperpolarize this membrane, uh, you actually get a series of uh, action potentials, and then it comes to a stop. Uh, so this has all this time I was talking about uh, uh, you know uh, about threshold stimulus giving rise to uh, uh, leading initiating an action potential. In this case, uh, you have an opposite opposite effect, right? You hyperpolarize the memory, and what this does is that it uh, uh, triggers a few action potentials and then it stops. And the reason is is that it has a calcium channel, and this is sort of what you want to look at. And these are the M and H of this particular special low threshold calcium channel. Now what you see here is that, again, the window of opportunity is, is uh, way below the resting membrane potential, right? The membrane, window of opportunity is minus 80, uh, or between minus 80 and 60, right? So what this does is that when you hyperpolarize the membrane and the membrane begins its uh, travel back to uh, steady, uh, to resting uh, voltage, 
it passes through this window of opportunity of this low threshold calcium channel. And this allows uh, the calcium to come in uh, and depolarizes the membrane. If the depolarization is enough, it can open uh, sodium channels on the way and voila, right? You get a bunch of uh, action potentials uh, 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 that can be triggered. Now, another important quality or attribute that this low threshold calcium channel needs to have is that it needs to have, and this is what is shown here, right? The tau, it also needs to be slow. So once it's it's supposed to open at hyperpolarized uh, 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 membrane potentials, but then it should be sluggish that it doesn't shut down immediately. So it opens up, and as the membrane depolarizes and goes through uh, its action potential excursions, uh, this particular channel knows it's supposed to shut down, but it's sluggish enough, so it takes its own sweet time uh, to um, uh, uh, to shut down, and this allows the um, this allows uh, um, uh, the membrane to go through action potential. So I'm going to sort of stop here. I have one more channel that I want to discuss, but I think you guys will be too tired if I don't do that. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, turn on my camera. Oh, okay. I see a bunch of questions. Great. Oh, somebody is a smart you, boy who's asking nice questions. Okay, I'm all ready. <laughs> Tell me more. Yes, anyway, so there have been what did the kid take? Lidocaine. The kid took lidocaine. I all of you must have gone through some dose of lidocaine or the other. All dentists used lidocaine. Should I just go through the questions? Um, or do you, uh, you guys uh, well, I, you you can? I think many of them we've been sort of trying to answer as we go along, but I think you could read through and see if uh, uh, if anything answer, that you want to yeah. add. Okay. Uh, but also they may ask new questions. I think there's one set of questions that we okay. uh, postponed uh, because there are several that I think Sushoban Naskar asked about okay. what are the factors controlling ionic equilibrium? What does it make sense inside the cell? When to stop the influx and efflux? You know, what will be the gate if, you know, they're basically just sort of asking, it sounds like it's a recap of the many of the things you were saying. So I don't know, right. in answering that, maybe you can reiterate. Right. So um, the, the, the heterogeneous distribution uh, is actively uh, maintained uh, by uh, pumps, right? And that sort of leads to, um, that sort of leads to this, uh, the, 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 um, the steady state values, right, <laughs> of the membrane potential. Uh, there are also uh, negatively uh, uh, charged sort of tails of your, uh, uh, proteins, uh, the lipid mem uh, mem that makes the uh, cell membrane more negative. That's uh, that's another reason why um, why uh, the membrane is more negative with respect to that sort of creates a separation of charges. Uh, the other uh, uh, reason is uh, the, that the cell is more permeable uh, at resting potential to potassium uh, ions. So potassium and because there's more actively, there's more potassium inside the cell, the tendency is for this potassium to go out because the cell membrane just happens to be more permeable to potassium. Uh, so this sort of this marriage of all this uh, uh, leads to the uh, negative membrane potential that is essential for excitability. Uh, does that answer, uh, who was it, uh, Sushoban, was that Sushoban, or who was this? Yes, I think, uh, I mean, it's fine. I think, I think people are also, there's a um, recent question said, like, you know, are there any uh, concise source of information that they can read, like what recommendation you would give for a book or uh, something, so. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I should be honest, what I taught you today, I typically do it in eight lectures. Um, and so it is uh, highly condensed, but I still wanted to uh, give you a sense of uh, the monumental achievement uh, by Hodgkin Huxley, right? And I, and I think in my abstract, I sort of uh, take that, uh, take, push it a bit further by calling it the basis of consciousness. Uh, but honestly, you know, we wouldn't have modern neuroscience without Hodgkin Huxley. So, you know, being the, given it's the first lecture, I did want to push that angle. But um, I did cut a lot of corners uh, uh, given in, in, in the interest of time. 
uh, uh, what I can do is I can maybe uh, let you have uh, the link to my lectures. You know, now, now all, all these lectures are online. So this is sort of covered in seven or eight lectures. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, I think maybe we could put, I think Vijay can uh, maybe uh, yeah. chime in. So the, the course website can probably have, if you want to put some links or something, that may be a convenient yeah, place to yeah. just have, have, the, have it linked. Um, yeah, and also, I think, yeah, Vatsala pointed out that the annotated Hodgkin Huxley papers, um, I don't know if Vatsala can, there's a link. I think, you, I don't know if you have to buy it or not, but that actually also a very beautiful. Uh, they are beautiful to, and they are hard to read. Um, the, those are really hard to read. That's like yeah. a summer project, yeah. Okay, I wanted to bring this up. It was mentioned that different neurons can have, uh, do the ions have different ion channels? Do the ions have different ion channel subtypes in these? Yes, they do. Uh, so this the, the sodium and potassium ion channels that I spoke about are the sort of caricatures of all ion channels, right? Most ion channels can be described in terms of their gates. They can be uh, anywhere from one to several gates. Uh, each of these gates can have a different rate at which they open, can have a different voltage sensitivity. And more importantly, they can be either activated by depolarization or inactivated by depolarization, right? So those are sort of broad uh, three or four classifications of how the gates can be. So they can be fast or slow. Uh, they, their voltage sensitivities can be different and they can either be activated uh, with depolarization or inactivated. And with this sort of uh, three properties, I think you can mostly describe uh, most of ion channels. Now there are certain ch ion channels that don't depend on voltage, uh, which depend on calcium. And these are very specialized calcium channels, uh, very, uh, very specialized calcium, uh, specialized channels that are very, very uh, uh, useful for certain um, dynamic uh, behavior, dynamical behavior. Uh, they're especially useful. I'm, I'm not sure if you already know of central pattern generators, but this these kind of antagonistic uh, interactions is what is the soul of any kind of patterns in the brain, right? Um, uh, uh, so, um, yeah, they, so, uh, in, sorry, I kind of jumped ahead of myself. Yes, they do have different properties. So I think there's, the, but there's several, several times people have asked, what is the, uh, um, what is the uh, zeta in uh, um, the uh, GHK equation? And I think it's, maybe you should explain it again, it's the valence of the ion. So I think it's a, several people yeah. asked a couple of times. Yeah, so that's sort of a long derivation. I, you know what, I just uh, put it up out there uh, so that you, I, I just make a, I write it up and uh, post it on the board or something. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I yeah, still I wanted to have it out there because it allows you, it, it's the first instant of how, that you need to think, start to think about the IV relationship to be non-linear. And so this rectification business keeps coming uh, uh, over and over again in any electrophysiology experiments. And this is the basis of, of how we understand the rectification, right? And so GHK allows you to think of uh, uh, IV relationship beyond the standard Ohm's law, right? Where the IV relationship is linear. Uh, having said that, uh, GHK can only explain um, outward rectification uh, for potassium. And given this is neuroscience, they're always uh, outliers. There are ion channels uh, that, uh, that actually show inward rectification for potassium. And so then you need to add another layer of sophistication to the GHK model to understand that. So uh, I had to send you a detailed uh, detailed derivation of the GHK, which I promised to send it across uh, in the next couple of days. Uh, uh, as a follow-up, do you know, also have low threshold calcium channels is a of a higher frequency? Um, inhibitory neurons actually, uh, 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 the thing about the fast inhibitory neurons can be different, right? They can have a really, really fast uh, sodium channel, uh, 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 a fast, uh, a slightly faster potassium channels, and also it can be uh, uh, the the fast firing can be uh, uh, encouraged or pushed on uh, by calcium channels. OK, 
Okay, so uh, Vijay, I don't know what um, um, what this schedule is now. Uh, what what we should do because I think um, the schedule time for Suhita is is formally at the end now, right? Yes, right. Yes. So we take a thirty minute break and then we come back for ATM stop.